So what I was saying is this, if we finish the discussion and you don't know the difference between particular statement and general statement, we have a big issue with you. If we finish and you don't know how to distinguish reference class from attribute class, it is a shame on you. If we finish our session and you cannot tell the types of generalizations we have, statistical and law-like, then shame on you. <laughs> you should understand by the time we finish that universal generalizations are also what? Conditional statements, just that we are, they are hidden. They have disguised themselves. So it is actually a conditional statement that has hidden itself, you know, so that people cannot immediately see that that universal statement standing there is actually a conditional. So we will use the skill by the end of this session, we'll have a skill that will help us open out every, con every conditional statement we see to show that it is a conditional statement. It has an if statement uh, clause and then a then clause. So for example, if I say all metals expand when heated, by the time we finish this, you should know that that means if X is a metal, then it will expand when heated. You have to be able to see that this universal statement, all metals expand when heated, is actually saying if X is a metal, where X represents any variable at all. So if X is a metal, then X will expand when heated. That is the nature of that universal statement. If you open it up, you will see that it is actually a conditional. Okay, No man is perfect. If X is a man, then X is not perfect. That's what the person is saying. We will be able to develop that skill better at the end of this discussion. Then. Remember something we have seen earlier, that deductive argument is not the same as inductive argument. Very good. Let's start reading the next one. Still outline. Four valid logistic, syllogistic patterns. It's syllogism, so syllogistic. Go ahead. Four valid syllogistic patterns. <laughs> Understanding <laughs> syllogisms. Understanding the yeah. Madam, please. Madam, please, can you do okay? Modus for affirming the antecedent. Modus calling, negating the gentleman. Julius, <laughs> If we continue like this, you won't have any any serious session. Hmm? I had my name. Oh, I had my name. Keep your microphone muted, please. Yeah, lady, go ahead. I muted all again, so just unmute and then go ahead, eh? And we'll do fine. I said, so on this screen. Okay. You should know four valid syllogistic patterns. They are four and they are valid. And they are syllogistic patterns. Syllogism just means two premises leading to what? A conclusion. When we studied arguments, we said when you have an argument, it means you have a conclusion that you are arriving at based on what? Premises that have been given. So if you have premises, reasons, evidence, which are two, two statements up there like that, leading to a conclusion. In other words, when you add the two premises to that one conclusion, you will have three step arguments, deductive argument. Then we say it is a syllogism, okay? So a syllogism means two premises and a conclusion. Deductive argument, eh? a deductive argument that has two premises and one conclusion. If it is an inductive argument, you won't call it a syllogism. Okay. So there are four of such. What are they? Modus ponens, modus tollens, disjunctive syllogism, like you're saying syllogistic, 
Ceylon before you add the J. So Ceylonism, then hypothetical Ceylonism. There are four of them that your book wants you to learn. Not that there are only four, there are more, but your book gives you only four. Study the test book, friends. Yo. Now, the surname for modus ponens is affirming the antecedent, okay? Whilst modus tollens is called denying the consequent. Look on the screen, okay? It is also called negating the consequent. Denying is another way of saying negating it, making it negative, negating the consequent. Then we have this uh, disjunctive syllogism and hypothetical syllogism. Now, those are the valid syllogistic patterns. It means they have two premises leading to a conclusion. They are deductions. You are trying to draw the conclusion directly from the premises. So they are deductions. And you do it right. You do that deduction correctly. So it is valid. Okay. So the valid syllogistic patterns are what? Modus this, modus that, is anti syllogism and hypothetical syllogism. And then I pointed out to you for emphasis that modus ponens has another name. It's called affirming the antecedent. When you are affirming, you affirm the antecedent. Take note, modus ponens. Whilst modus tollens is called negating the consequent. Then there are other two names. Now, if you look down, still on the screen that your friend was reading, there are fallacies. The word fallacy is an error. We've seen it already in, introduction, in our introduction, okay? Fallacies, but they are described as formal fallacies. The form, you are disobeying the form of deduction. You are not going by the mechanic of it. It is like you have a password, you slide to, or, or, on, on, what is the word? To, to have access to your phone. So you have locked your phone. If you want to unlock, maybe you go from one to three, then, three to nine, uh, six down there, then six to nine, something. That's the shape that you do, and then the phone will unlock. It's a pattern. Now, if someone else wants to access your phone when it is locked, and the person uses M shape, what you do is maybe a Z on it. If the person does M, it won't unlock that. The person can do W shape on your, your keypad. I'm trying to show you, it is a pattern, a form, a structure. Now, the four syllogistic patterns at the top there have a pattern that you must follow to make it correctly modus ponens, correctly modus tollens, correctly disjunctive syllogism and the other one. Now, if someone is trying to do that pattern, any of those four at the top there, but does it wrongly so that the deduction is not a valid one, it will become a fallacy, yes. But which kind of fallacy would that be? It's a fallacy of the form. You didn't obey the form, the pattern. So we call those ones formal fallacies. Okay, not like the informal fallacies you will learn in unit 10. Maybe you have even read, uh, played the video from Dr. Morgan already. Okay, those are informal, appeal to the masses, appeal to threat, ad hominem fallacy, argumentum ad popular, those ones, they are informal. It's not, there's no uh, mechanical rule that someone has disobeyed, okay? So on the screen now, even at outline, I'm setting out some things for you. If you follow this, you will have less stress. Formal fallacies have a name also. Why? They are pretending to be like the original, but they don't succeed. So one of them is the fallacy of affirming the, when you hear affirming, you thought that we'll be doing modus ponens. Look at the top here, where we affirm the antecedent. But this person doesn't affirm the antecedent. The person is affirming the what? The consequent, can see? So it's a fallacy. Instead of going from one to three, then across diagonally to uh, uh, what, what? Seven to nine, you see on your, on your keypad, if you have your phone, it's numbered one, two, three, then the next line, four, five, six, then the last one, seven, eight, nine. That's what you have there. So maybe to unlock Sister Joyce's phone, she will slide from one to three, then diagonally from three all the way down to seven, and then from seven to nine. So that will create a Z. Eh? What you call Z, Z, like this. Then the phone will unlock. And Tiajua's friend comes and wants to see what the friend, you know, and what money she has. There. So she wants to unlock her phone without her permission. So she's trying. She can do three to one 
watch. So it is moving leftwards from three to one, and from one all the way to five. What did we five? One, two, three, two, three, six, eh? whatever. From three all the way down, and then backwards. She's still doing a Z, but we but you have turned it upside down. The phone will not unlock that. Even though we say, oh, but this is Z, I just turned it upside down. It won't unlock. The fallacies that we call formal fallacies are doing that. That's why they have a name. They are pretending to be like the original. If you see them standing, they look like the original. But there is something wrong with the form. So it is not unlocking. One of them is fallacy of affirming the consequent. Instead of affirming the antecedent, that this pattern affirms the consequent rather. So know that. Then when I show you, you can connect the two and you are good to go. The second one is called fallacy of negating. Look up there. When we are going to negate, we, we know that we should rather negate consequent so that it will be called modus tollens. But this one doesn't negate the consequent in the premises. See, it is rather negating the antecedent. That's fallacious, formally. Then we have the false hypothetical syllogism. In fact, there is also the false disjunctive syllogism. But the textbook doesn't touch on it. You see that, so I didn't put it there. So we, we will learn that valid arguments and sound arguments are not the same. Soundness is an extra quality, an additional one. After the thing, the, the argument is valid deductively and its premises are all true, then you can say, oh, then it is sound. So sound means you are already valid. The argument is already valid, deductively. Validity is a quality of deduction. You can say an inductive argument is valid. That is, that, that, that is meaningless. If it is inductive, I, inductive, it cannot be valid. Okay, validity is a, a feature, a quality, a property only of deduction. So if your deductive argument is first of all valid, modus ponens, tollens, disjunctive syllogism, hypothetical syllogism, first of all valid by that pattern, and there comes the additional quality, and the premises are already true. In other words, they are actually true out there. Then you can say that that argument is what? Sound. So when I say it is sound, I already have said that it is valid first and it has true premise. That means validity plus true premises equals sound argument. An argument that is sound would already be valid. But the fact that an argument is valid but has false premises, that will not make it false sound. Well done. So we, even if we never get to that slide, you have the substance already there. So you know syllogism, if you're making notes, write it down. You know syllogism, you know validity. You can distinguish that from soundness. You know the reason why we call some patterns formal. Take note of oh, mm, this one. You can get zero, you won't even know that you got zero for this unit. If it is worth 30 of your final, you won't even know that you have gotten zero. <laughs> In it's six, seven, nine, ten. They are substance. They are no jokes. <laughs> All the others are very important, but they are typically language. You see that so far, what we've done, interrogative, imperative. No, no, they are just language so far. We have now entered into the reasoning bit where you are doing the actual critical thinking work. So I want you to be committed and have a different posture than the joking posture, okay? And so far, so good. So I say, take note, we have touched on what? Validity. We say if an, a, an argument is valid and it has true premises, then we'll say that is what? Sound. Shinyatoho, you may never revise, get to revise it again. But if you understand it this way, it's stuck forever and ever. Amen. So that is soundness. Then we saw why we describe these fallacies as what? Formal fallacies. They are errors, yes, but they are not informal in nature. These are formal because they are disobeying the pattern, the form of deduction that they pretend to be doing. So there is, a, this, there is a rule, there are rules for deduction that these argument patterns do not follow. You don't follow the form. That's why we say they are formal fallacies and you know their name. Then we know the valid deductive patterns that your book has given you to learn. There are four of them. 
all the modus friends, and then disjunct disjunctive, and then the hypothetical. Take note that all the four of them are syllogisms, really. The fact that they don't bear the name syllogism doesn't mean they are not. Modus ponens is a, a three-step reasoning pattern, two premises, one conclusion. So it is a syllogism anyway. Modus tollens, the same, it's also a syllogism. It just doesn't have the name syllogism, but it is. All right, so we, we just did that one also. Then I, I told you to understand and keep in mind why we call them syllogisms. Good, let me pause for questions. Please, those whose hands are up to read, can you kindly, respectfully put your hands down? I want to see if there are questions. I'll take them, then we go back to our reading. Even if we do only three slides and you get it very well, we'll build on it. No rush. Not that we run out, then we finish. When I ask you syllogism, you are sitting there. When I ask you what is an antecedent, you don't know. I don't teach that way. So patience, concision, understanding. We target understanding. Lutrot, ask your question, sir. George Lutrot. If it's not a question, Claudia Norte, ask your question. If it is not a question, I ask that you put your hands down, please, so I can save some time. If it is not a question, keep your hand down. Simple instruction. You see, I'm committing a formal fallacy. <laughs> keep your hand down so we can easily know the one whose one is a genuine question. We ask them, they ask, we answer, then we move on. Quick, all hands are up. Claudia, if your hand is up, then unmute and ask your question. Theophilus Chegi, Chegi, ask your question. Please, princess, if it's a question, ask. Just unmute and ask. Please, can you go over the sound again? I didn't seem to get it. What, are, what is your sound argument? This, we did this in lecture three, weren't we? The argument is first of all valid, then its premises are true. That's what soundness is. Okay. Oh, okay, thank you. Good. So if it is modus ponens valid or modus tollens valid or hypothetical syllogism valid, disjunctive syllogism valid, any of the patterns, it's valid first. Valid just means it is deductive. The premises are true. It will require that the conclusion must also be true. If you establish that it is valid first, whichever pattern of whichever validity is not even an issue for us. After that, check if the premises are all true. If they are true, if premises here are the reasons you have offered to arrive at that conclusion, if they are all true, then the argument is not just valid, but it is sound. Theophilus, ask your question. Any question, Tracy? Okay, any of the hands up? Because your friends are not reacting. So do, those whose hands are, I see seven hands up. Okay. Uh, if you haven't called okay. you, please ask your question. Go ahead, Eric. Please, madam. Um, I would like you to go again on the, the formal fallacies. What, how did you understand it earlier, please? Um, it's like when you're not following the correct pattern. Of deduction. That's correct. Yeah. Yes, it's correct. That is it. That is it, sir. Okay, so you got okay. it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So what is important now is now to know the valid patterns so that when you see some argument disobeying it, you can tell. If you know an original dollar note, then when they give you the fake one, you can de determine that, oh, this one is not original, okay? So now I've told you that uh, the, the, uh, the ones that are not original, they have so-and-so name. We've got them counterfeit or something like that. that. That's what I've done. Now we are going to go into the substance. I'll show you if it's a dollar note, when you crash it and you drop it, it will start spreading itself out again by itself. It will not remain as if you crash it to still start spreading. That's it, one sign. You see, you see this uh, sign here. You see that sign here. So that sign will be doing as we go on. Okay, very good. Is there another question? Uh, please, there are now yes, six hands up. Yes, please unmute and ask quickly, quickly, friends. Okay. Hello? Please, madam, under the modus ponens. Uh... What has it done? What has you said under the modus ponens, what has it done? Uh, please, I didn't get the understanding of it. So. I've not taught modus ponens. I showed you that it is one of the valid syllogistic patterns that you must know. Yeah, that's all I've said. Okay. So we are now going to learn what yeah. makes. Yeah, okay. 
Is there any other question? Is there any other question? Please ask quickly. Please ask quickly. Go ahead. Hello. Sydney, ask your question. Oh, we are wasting time. Please ask. So is the antecedent? I've not mentioned the antecedent. When I mentioned the antecedent, I only used it to show you the name. So if you see modus ponens, you can also call it affirming the antecedent. Okay, that's the name. Now Hello. we'll go into the pattern proper and show you which kind of pattern of reasoning you will call what modus ponens. Do you see that? So now I'm just showing you names, labels. Then when we start with the content proper ahead of us, you can connect. So I'm saying that the if you end this session now, there are things you know from today that you can confidently walk away with for unit six, which is what? One, that there are four ways of arguing, reasoning, validly. There are four at least. There will be more, but your book gave you only four, so we'll focus on that. There are four. What are their names? There is a name given to that correct way of reasoning. Modus ponens is one. Modus tollens is another. Hypothetical, one. And then there's junctive syllogies, one. There are four of them. Now it turns out that modus ponens has another name, just like a statement is also a proposition. It's also an assertion. You see, so I'm showing you that also now. Modus ponens, other name is affirming the antecedent. Whatever antecedent is, is not get confused. Just know for now the labels. Okay, the raw ingredients. We are going to do a pakransa. We will need jenny onion, eh? pepper, tomatoes, this, uh, palm fruit. When you see those, don't ask, so what would the palm fruit be doing? It? How will you know that? That's what the whole business is about. But right now, we want you to know the raw materials, this. So you have to get onion, then you bring it. Get pepper, then you bring it. Bring me benkuta, the benkuta. You know the benkuta? <laughs> bring it, then we'll be bringing. So I ring them all. Then when we finish, I say, don't use, remember that onion, we have the shallot one and we have this one. I'm, when I'm saying all that, I'm just giving you the raw material. We haven't started cooking. Okay, sir. So keep that in mind. Thank you very much. Let's take one more because I think the others are just. Uh, okay. Hello, madam. Yes, madam Marino, go ahead. Marino, go ahead. What's, okay, madam. So I wanted to know if all fallacies are there because of an error in a statement. Of an argument. fallacy means error in reasoning. That's all. Topic one. I engage you on that. Error. So you can have fallacies that are informal in nature. That is unit 10. These ones are not informal fallacies. Okay, okay. Sure. These are formal fallacies. Very good. You, when you get to unit 9, you will see causal fallacies, cause and effect reasoning, and fallacies associated with that. They are also there. Post hoc, ego, doctor hoc. Uh, uh, what is the other one? They are all there in unit 9. You engage it. If you have already looked at the video, is there? So you need to know the categorizations of those fallacies. Formal fallacies, they are committed when you are trying to do the correct pattern of deduction. You are trying to do those deductive forms, but you do it incorrectly. Okay, then we call them formal fallacies. So they are errors in the way you are deducing. Causal okay. fallacies, they are fallacies. So I'm telling your friends now, I know you, you got it, so don't, not to worry. The, the, the other one, Causal fallacies are fallacies associated with the cause and effect reasoning. Okay, that's another one. Then the informal fallacies, you are appealing to masses or you are appealing to threats, appealing to threats to make a, a, a point or so on. So they are informal. When you get to unit 10, the content there will tell you how to distinguish. Oh, okay, okay, sure. sure. Well done. Very important questions you guys have asked. So we can now move on quickly. We will do what we have said, we will keep doing. And so far, I think folks are carrying themselves well. When you do that, you, you live with so much substance and you'll do fine. Now I can move quickly to the next slide, slide four. And I want uh, Lydia to read, excuse me, uh, Boahin. Is it Boahin? The sister who is reading for us. Please read deduction. Versus yes, madam. Go ahead, go ahead. Deduction versus induction. Oh. Yes, madam. Go on. These terms describe two types of arguments. So you should know 
Hold on, Auntie. So for the units, unit six, if you finish today's lecture, you must know that there are two ways of arguing. There are two types of arguments. One is deduction, while the other one is induction. It means if you don't even know what deduction and kasa is simple. You see, friends, that's how you learn. You learn from the known to the unknown. When you want to know the unknown, when you don't even know what you know. That's what creates a whole confusion. When they ask you your name, if you are not careful, you say Akra. Maybe you are not called Akra, but you scratch your head and say Akra. Because that time you are thinking about where you are standing, not what they are asking you. So move in a steady, <laughs> uh, <what's your> <laughs> move in a steady, relaxed, but focused, serious posture. Um, look at what I'm doing. Does it look like I'm playing? No. But am I beating anybody to? No. Just that I am committed to it. Five minutes should count so much. In a way that when the person now takes the content and he or she is engaging it, the content now reveals itself to you. Not that they will do that thing. No, you can't do that with a critical thinking. You, know. you can write it seven times and still count it. You see, but you, dear my next you straight a back. I even help others. That's the target. So even on this slide, if we entered here, what can I get from here? Oh, there are two types of arguments. In other words, there are two ways of what? Supporting our claims with evidence. That's what argument is. There are two ways of doing that. That's what the lady said. It could be a, a multiple choice question. One of the following is not the type of argument. Then they write, enter me. Syllogism. Induction. You know, things like that. Then if you don't know, you don't know. You stretch your neck half of it. Okay, but this one you know. So sister says there are two types of argument. Please continue. Two ways of reasoning, two ways of supporting a claim with evidence or evidence. I muted all again. Someone is giving us feedback. So please unmute yours now and talk. Deductive argument. If the premises are true, then the conclusion is also necessary to true or register. Yeah. Inductive argument. The conclusion may not necessarily follow. That means it may not be true, Very even good. if the premises are true. Very good. I like the way you read that. That means it's just another way of saying the same thing. So remember my example one with you. When I said the class rep was the last person who left the room yesterday. Therefore, I'm concluding that he stole the laptop. Premises, he was a So therefore, hence, as a result, consequently, these are what conclusion indicators. They point to the conclusion. If you have an argument there, then when you see so, hence, thus, it doesn't mean any time you see the word so sitting somewhere, you should conclude that the passage you have there is an argument. That's why we learn types of passages. Some are narrations. They are just narrating how something happened. Unit three. Some are instructions. They are telling you how to get it done, how to get there. Then some are just rhetorical polemics or polemical rhetorics, emotions, emotional expressions, strong uh, feelings captured into a passage. So a discourse just means a passage, a collection of sentences. Okay. Now, where you have a collection of sentences that they are acting as an argument, what is an argument? Where there is a claim being made and evidence or reasons or premises being used to support that claim. Then we have an argument, the two together form what an argument. And we are saying that there are two such types of argument. For one of them, if you accepted the premises as true, the evidence that is being given to you is another word for premise, reasons, okay? If you accepted those reasons to be true, it will mean already that you have accepted the conclusion. So you can't accept the premises and then you want to reject the conclusion as not true. When you do that, then you create a tension, a contradiction. Contra means opposite, diction, language, opposite language. So you will not be talking as if you are saying a bachelor has beaten his wife. That is what cannot be accepted. So where an argument is deductive, D for Daniel, deductive, it means if you accepted, look, if 
doesn't mean the premises are actually true, no. But if you accepted the premises as true, that is if we all assumed it to be true, if we even took it to be true, the premises you are offering, it will mean that then we have already taken the conclusion also to be true. Why? Because the conclusion is already part of the premise. That's the nature of a deed that give give. So if you accept the premises as true, it will mean that you have already accepted the conclusion as true. That kind of argument is the one we call a deduction and a valid one at that, if it is valid. So modus ponens, modus tollens, which we saw in our outline, mm, and hypothetical syllogism and disjunctive syllogism are all deductive arguments that are what? Valid, correctly done. In other words, the other four that we saw, I think there were three, the, other, the others that we call fallacies, former fallacies, they are also trying to deduce, but they are not deducing well. So we'll learn that also later. But here in a valid deductive argument, if the premises are true, it will necessarily require that the conclusion must also be true. Otherwise, you will create a contradiction. The key word there is necessarily true. Then your friend read that the opposite, the contrast, is that you can have an argument which is not deductive, where the conclusion necessarily follows from the premises. But then it is rather what? Inductive. That is simply the conclusion is not necessarily part of the premises. So you can accept the premises as true, and you will not be required by force necessarily to also accept the conclusion. This is the distinction between inductive argument and deductive argument. If you understood that, then when I tell you that the class rep was the last person who left the room yesterday, so he stole the laptop. What conclusion am I drawing? He stole the laptop. What is the evidence I'm proffering for that? He was the last person who left the room. We say, look, even if we accepted it to be true that he was the last person who left the room, it doesn't mean that we are obliged necessarily to accept that, therefore, he stole the laptop. Can you see that? No, we are not obliged to. We can accept that it is true that he's the last person who left. But that doesn't mean by force that, therefore, we should also accept that he stole the laptop. So it means that reasoning, which I just gave you, is induced. You are forcing it. It's an inductive argument. However, if I say all oh, women and that one, I'll take responses. So get ready. I want a chorus answer when I finish. So don't worry. People don't like sitting down like this, this long. They are tight. So I'll let you talk chorus, then we all meet again. So get ready. It is coming. If I say all oh, women are elephants, remember, it doesn't have to be actually true. Hey, we need the answer. <laughs> if I say all oh, women are elephants. My father is a woman. What conclusion necessarily follows? I want chorus answer. So everybody on mute and talk. My father is an elephant. My father is an elephant. My father is an elephant. I just muted you all again. Look at the funny thing I said, that it to be valid. All women are elephants. My father is a woman. He has to follow necessarily. Therefore, then, that my father is an elephant. Valid. It's called modus ponens. The reasoning pattern there is what we call modus ponens. You're going to see it shortly. All men like pineapple. And all who like pineapple go to heaven. It will follow that all men go to heaven. Hypothetical syllogism is the pattern. All A's are B's, and all B's are C's. It has to follow, therefore, that all A's are C's. Hypothetical syllogism. So I'm trying to show you what makes an argument a deductive one if the premises are assumed to be true. Because we know men are not women. Not all men like pineapple. Look at the examples I've given. But it is not whether it is actually true or actually false. It is if we were to assume those premises to be true, and then we draw a certain conclusion based on that, would this conclusion necessarily follow? So all A's are B's. This thing I'm holding is an A. If what I'm holding is an A, then what is true of all A's must apply to this thing also. Okay. So all A's are B's. 
this thing I'm holding is an A. It will follow, therefore, that that thing I'm holding is what? A B, modus ponens, valid. If you accepted the true to be true, the conclusion you have drawn, you see, will necessarily follow. That is what makes it deductive and not inductive. So you know the two very well. Now, Sister Reed, when you get tired, prompt me, eh? You have a good background, and I think you're reading well. That's I don't want to change. Go on. Recall argument. Argument. A passage that contains a single conclusion that is presented as a logical consequence of reason that is premises or evidence of it. That, hence, therefore, so, indicates conclusion. Since, if, given that, provided, indicates premises or reasons or evidence. Refer to, the to refer to the text, for example, that plenty in your textbook you should reference. Now compare the two. Let me see. There are hands up before I'm, I'm accused of. A. So is it color? Today, to the color name has come. Is it her name proper or something? Enki. If you have a good background, take it up from my lady boy here. And sister, be on standby. If I'm having issues, I'll call you to continue. Go ahead, Enki. Enki, I do it. Um, okay, madam. Yeah. You, Madam, ma please, my screen is still on the deduction versus induction. I've not seen the next slide. I've, I have changed it. Yeah, Friends, but I've not seen it. Oh, please, do you see compare yes. on, on the screen class? Madam, yes, please, Madam. I can yes, see. Yes, yes. 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 yes, please. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yes. 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 Madam, I can see now. Yes, it's okay. Please, I can see. Excellent. It's it's often a, a network thing. So let's hear Kalana. In Piado. Piado, go ahead. Com okay. Compare two types of arguments. Mm -hmm. Deductive. Mm -hmm. All students write exams. Amma is a student, so she writes exams. So pause for a minute. You see, mm -hmm. what is the conclusion of our argument on the screen, class? Hey, you ready? <laughs> So she writes. So she writes. She writes. She writes. She writes. She writes. She writes. So she writes. Exam. Exam. So she writes. Exam. She writes. Well done. I've muted all now. I, I sometimes it helps. Okay, so that we can we can be encouraged by each other. But take note. If I ask you, you won't add the so because the so is only a point. It's only indicating, it's only showing you which of the statements you should look at. Okay, so that's so I already posted the slides for you. Please, you can't see the screen. I can see, be conscious of generalization. Okay, please be conscious of that. But just say, I can see. Okay, so that others can help you. Could be a network thing that will come. See, I'm saying that if I ask you for the conclusion, you should say, she writes exam, this one. So that you don't add the so, because the so is only a pointer. Okay, it's only a pointer. That's the point I'm making. Then the other two up there are the premises. All students write exams. Amma is a student. So there are two premises leading to a conclusion. And the reasoning is a deductive one. How would you label that? If you have two premises leading to a conclusion, in a deductive argument, how will you label that? Uh, it is it is sound argument. argument. Two it's premises. Argument. Listen to me. Sound two premises. Two premises leading to conclusion. Set of questions. Some some put the answer sound. Some say yes. Sound. Yes. Sound. Some people they won't give. They give a background. So they won't. Listen. If I gave you this preamble, I said the argument below has two premises leading to what a conclusion. So the the deductive argument below has two premises leading to a conclusion. How would you describe it? The description I've given you only points to what we call syllogism. Yes, so it's a syllogism. Because I said there are two premises 
leading to what? A conclusion. It's a deductive argument, which has two premises leading to a conclusion. That is it. If you want to say it is sound, then you say this is a valid argument and both of its premises are what? True. That is what will make it sound. I hope you get that. So you are right that it is a sound argument, but the question I asked was looking for something. I said there are two premises leading to a conclusion, and this is a deductive argument. How would you describe it? It is a syllogism. Then I could have asked you, the argument below has both of its premises being true, and it is valid. How would you describe it? Then you can tell me it is sound, and so on and so forth. Well done, I think you got that. So my friend read this nicely, the lady, uh, Kala. All students write exams. Amma is a student, so she writes exams. Now, if we accepted the premises as true, that all students write exams, that's the first premise. And then the second premise says, Amma is a student. Then we are obliged to accept that then she writes exams. Look at it very well. Because we know something about all students, and we are taking it to be true that all students write exams. If it is true that all students write exams, now we have also accepted that it is true that Amma is a student. Then it has to be, it must be true that she, like all students, also writes exams. This is valid. It is called modus ponens. Write it down somewhere. So after you say all students write exams, the student bit, the, the statement in front, uh, what can I mean? The first part of that, your universal statement, is the antecedent. A gentleman who asked me antecedent. I'm showing you that now. Okay, antecedent, all students. Then the consequent is what? Write exams. It's a universal statement. So all students write exams. If X is a student, then X will write exams. That is what that statement means. If X is a student, then X will write exam. If antecedent, then consequent. That is what it means to say all students write exam. So the student part, the statement that contains the student, if X is a student, is the antecedent. Then the one that says write exams is the what? The consequent. So if antecedent happens, then consequent will follow. That is it. That's what you see. All student write exam. Okay. Take note all. Every student do. No man is perfect. Whenever it rains, the ground gets all metals expand when it universal generalization. Now that's premise one. Now, what happened in the second premise? That is making us say that this reasoning is valid. Look at what happened. When we said all students write exams. The next premise did what said, Amma is a student. We already said the student is our antecedent. What happens first before something else will follow it? All students write exams. So Amma is a student. Okay, we are establishing the antecedent. We are affirming what the antecedent said. We are restating what the antecedent said. Can you see that student? So Amma is a student. That is what happens right after the universal statement. After we give our universal statement, which is a conditional in this guide, then that. Right after that, what we do next is to affirm the antecedent in the premises, not in the conclusion. Okay. So when we affirm the antecedent, then now we can conclude oh, by, by affirming the concept. We don't care what, the, what is happening in the conclusion. So the, the focus is on what? The premises. All student writes exam. Amma is a student. I've affirmed the antecedent. Therefore, see the conclusion. So she writes exam. This is valid. And the validity is by uh, modus ponens. See the name we gave to that. I think my slide. I'll go back. See, modus ponens has another name. It's called affirming the antecedent. Okay? So not only is that argument over there valid, the validity is a specific type. Now you can learn it. Where after the universal statement, what you did next was to affirm the what? The antecedent. It is deductive. And what type of deduction is that? Modus. 
ponens. Po for Paul. P for Paul. Modus ponens. Now let us try our hands on that a little before we move on to another one. So I'm going to give you a universal statement. All women are cheat. Apologies, ladies. I'm also a woman. All women are cheat. Let's all use the name Adjoa and then create a modus ponens valid argument. All women are cheat. What should be the next premise? Using Adjoa. We will all use Adjoa so we have a uniform answer. We are starting from all women are cheat. We want to create modus ponens valid argument. I want a hand up. Okay, I see 11 hands. If you have it, keep, keep raising your hand. I want to see if you understand. All women are cheat. Hey, Baya. Baya, how are you? Hold on. I want to get those who know it. I, I mean, from the little we've done, modus ponens, there. we are champions on that for today. Until we build on it. That is the one we know. It's a deductive argument. Yes, we know that one. Because if we accepted the premises as true, we will be required to accept the conclusion also as true. No problem. Now we are trying to find out which type of deductive argument that is. And we have even gone one step ahead. We say it's modus ponens. So we are trying our hands on that. All women are cheat. Let's use a joy. The next premise must be I see 46 hands. Very good. Now I'll take one person. By the Abbey. So all women are cheat. What should be the next premise using Adjoa to create a valid modus ponens argument? Right, Abby? Adjoa Go is a woman. Very good. Therefore, Adjoa is a cheat. Excellent. Well done. Yes. So from all women are cheat, trying to create a modus ponens valid argument, which we learned is also called affirming the antecedent. I don't know yet. There are others, so when we start adding the others, confusion can be bizarre. So don't rush, don't be in a rush to think, I, I got it, I got it covered, I got it covered. I've been now comfortable. Yeah, you got it covered. You're you out of this. <laughs> Chill, brah. Let's do one, one step at a time. So, so Lydia Ebida says, after saying all women are cheats, we took Adjoa as a, a uniform particular instance, and we want to do more disponents. So we said Adjoa is a woman. Woman. That is what it means. Woman. So Ajua is a woman. Therefore, we can conclude that Ajua is a cheat. And this pattern will be valid. And sister says the validity is a modus ponens one. And the reason I think that we can all share in is because the second premise, right after the universal statement, affirmed the antecedent. It didn't affirm the consequent. So because of that, we say it's modus pone. Very good. One more example. I want to see if you understand. Modus. You, if you are my friend, write it down in your notepad. If you are my friend, you will tell me the truth. If you are my friend, then you will tell me the truth. You see that now, I didn't say all oh, this I've done. I use the if then, the conditional. But we already learned in our outline that conditionals and universal statements are the same. When you have a universal statement, you can open it out as a conditional. So a conditional statement has the same Bobby <laughs> personality as what? A universal statement. So we say, if you are my friend, then you will tell me the truth. Let's use, uh, hold on, let's use Kojo so we have a uniform answer. And we are building a modus ponens valid argument. Ponens, Paul. So we will be affirming what? The antecedent. Who is that? I want to call someone. Don't talk. Let me take CL Blankson. CL, I hope I. C I E L, CL Blankson. We want to do modus ponens valid argument using Kujo from the premise, if you are my friend, then you will tell me the truth. Chill, go ahead. You are muted. Therefore, he will tell me the truth. Well done. So Kujo is my friend. Therefore, he will tell me the truth. The past tense and the present tense, 
doesn't matter for us. You can say, Kojo is my friend. Therefore, he told me the truth. Therefore, he's telling me the truth. Therefore, he shall tell me the truth. It doesn't matter. It is the logic of it that we are interested in, the connective. So if you are my friend, then you will tell me the truth. First premise, universal or conditional. Next premise should affirm the antecedent if we are looking for a valid deduction by modus ponens, not the other ones, okay? So sister says, Kojo is my friend. Therefore, he will tell me the truth. That is valid. No problems about that. Now, what we don't want you to do, we'll come back to this slide here. I'm teaching you with experience and grace. <laughs> so follow systematically and you'll do fine. Now, what you shouldn't do is to say this. And so we'll go to the screen quickly. I want to show you the one that is pretending, that fake dollar. I told you about Dallas. And if you know the original, then you are able to detect the fake one, okay? So I'm going to show you someone, the, the patterns that are trying to do what the original does, but are not doing it well. So see on my screen now, you see formal or syllogistic fallacies. We have explained what they are, all the four of them. In fact, your book, your book gave you three. So all the three formal syllogistic fallacies, we saw them. How will you know them? Know the original, and you can tell the fake when you see one. So you know modus ponens. If A, then B. A has come, therefore B must fall. That's modus ponens. Now, modus tollens, excuse me, uh, the, the fallacy that is trying to do modus ponens will not go according to that part. They will rather say, if A, then B. Then the next premise will go and say, B has happened. Therefore, we should take it that A too must happen. We say, Whoo, we don't like that one. So let's just put the flesh on it so you see it very well. The example that we work with is all women are cheats. This person who is committing the formal fallacy of affirming the consequent instead of affirm, affirming anticipate. Remember, mm? that person will say, all women are cheats. Ajua is a cheat. So let's put X so that I don't get confused. X is a cheat. Therefore, we should assume that X is a woman. Now that is a problem. So I say it again. And we'll use the screen. Look on the screen now. This is the fallacy that is affirming the consequent. It doesn't do modus ponens well. Okay, look at where the arrow is, this one. So all X's are Y. If it's modus ponens, we should say this thing is an X. Then it means we are bringing the antecedent right after the conditional. Then we can conclude then this thing is what? A Y. That would have been valid. But the person doesn't do that. That's why we say it's a fallacy. See, he says all X's are Y. Then he says, this thing is a why is bringing the consequent rather next after the conditional state. Then he concludes, therefore, we should take it that it is an X. There is a logic to it if we did a Venn diagram, but there's no point going through that with you. Just understand that this reasoning is not valid. If I say all mangoes are fruits, then my next premise says, this thing I'm holding is a fruit. Therefore, we should conclude by force that it is a mango. We will have a problem. Okay, if I said all women are cheats, then I say the person in my room now is a cheat. Therefore, we should assume that the person is a woman. But men too can be cheat. You see, so all A's are B's. All women are cheats. Is saying all women are inside the bigger set called cheats. So if you plotted on a Venn diagram, you put the circle of women inside the rectangle of what? Cheats which leaves enough room for men also to be there and hermaphrodites also. <laughs> Therefore, what have we learned so far? If it is modus ponens, then this is the pattern you have. If antecedent, then consequent. Next premise, antecedent. Therefore, conclusion will be what? Consequent, that's valid. Modus ponens. The invalid 
pattern that tries to do modus ponens is the one we have called affirming the consequence. What's that pattern? It says, if antecedent, then consequent. Next premise will say, consequent, therefore we should assume antecedent. We said, no, that is not valid. It is rather the fallacy of what? Affirming the consequent. Excellent. Now we can move back to our original slide where we are trying to learn what deduction and whether it is distinct or not from induction. See how to learn. So on this slide, when we, one of you was reading, we saw this. Please read over again, deduction and continue, my lady. Yes, please. Deductive. All students write exams. Amma mm -hmm. is a student, so she writes exams. Very good. That is deduction. So that is deduction. Yeah. We now know which yeah. type of deduction it is. It is a modus ponens. We can even tell a, another pattern that will try to be doing deduct, uh, modus ponens and will not do it well. We know that. See how we cover grounds? So now the other three that we must know are what? Modus tollens. Hypothetical syllogism and disjunctive syllogism. And then we should know their counterpart that pretend to be like that. So that read inductive argument. Inductive. Yes. Most Ghanaians are hospitable. My mother is a Ghanaian, therefore she is hospitable. If we were to assume that it is true that most Ghanaians are hospitable, you know, people can contend that and say it's not true. Ghanaians almost say they are hospitable, they are not, blah, blah, blah. blah. We can argue over that. But let us assume that we were not even arguing over that. We all agreed that most Ghanaians are hospitable. Then we all agreed that my mother is a Ghanaian. Maybe you say, no, your mother is not Ghanaian. She's from whatever. No. Let's agree that the two premises are accepted to be true. Doesn't necessarily mean that she is going to be like most Ghanaians and be hospitable. Look at this. No. Not necessarily. Can you see that? I want a chorus answer. They will go back. Should no. we accept? No, we are, we are not obliged. No, okay. no, no, no. Hey, no. 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 Yes. Oh. No, so doctor. It, yes, madam. So if it is so, then that reasoning, the person who is forcing that conclusion down your throat, no. tell them that this one not induced. Mm? Other than that, this one, the induced conclusion. That's what we mean when we say inductive. The conclusion, she is hospitable, that you are pushing uh, you know, to her face like that. It's, a, it's by force. You are forcing that conclusion out of the premises you are offering. They are not part of it necessarily. You are imposing the conclusion. When we say we want to induce vomiting, you know what that means, if you're a nurse. Or so the child takes him poison or something. You say, give him, oh, give him palm oil, give him palm oil. Let us induce vomiting. It means you, the child hasn't said he wants to vomit. But because of what has gone in there, you want to force the vomit out. Inductive arguments are like that. Their conclusions are being forced out of the premises. The premises cannot substantiate that conclusion absolutely. You got that. Very good. Some more examples. Sister, please read. My slide has okay. Now I see. Okay. Since the since the security man was the last person who left the building yesterday, he stole the project leader's laptop. We can all see why this is inductive, and I have given that example already using the classroom. So I'm to go ahead to the deductive down there. Okay. All mangoes are fruit. My pen is not a fruit, so it is not a mango. Very good. This is also deductive. I'm going to introduce the next, the next deductive form. So get ready. I told you they are just patterns, structure, designs. So you have to follow it. You move from here to here and here to here. That's all. That's all it is. There's no anything. Okay. So the second deductive argument example you have on the screen is not the one we met earlier, even though they are both what valid. But the one we met earlier was modus ponens. All mangoes are fruit. What I'm holding is a mango. Then I have to deductively conclude therefore that it is a fruit. Modus ponens, affirming the antecedent. So we, we saw that one. 
if we try to do it differently from that by bringing the consequent rather before concluding with the antecedent, we know that that's the formal fallacy called the fallacy of affirming the consequent. So we have learned those three. Now on the screen now, we have another valid form, not modus ponens, not modus for, okay, <laughs> yeah, but modus timoti, modus tolerance in its own way. So let's see. The person says all mangoes are fruit. I explain what that is. One is a subset of the other. All mangoes are inside the big set of what? Fruits. So mangoes are a subset of fruit. If you do the Venn diagram by yourself as you're seated, you see what I'm saying? That's the first premise. Okay. Then the second premise says, I am holding something, a pen maybe. Okay. So my pen is not a fruit. My pen is not even in the bigger set. Then it will follow necessarily that it cannot be inside a smaller set, inside a big set. Can you see that? So all mangoes are fruit. My pen is not even a fruit. Mangoes, Nankasa, they are inside fruit, a set of fruit. Now I'm holding a pen. The pen cannot find its way even into the bigger set. How can you expect that it will find itself inside the smaller set, which is inside the big set, okay? So think of it that way. The baby's heart is inside that baby. Whilst the baby is inside its mother, that is modus ponens. So the heart, the, subs, the small heart is inside the baby. And the baby itself is inside the mother. So if you call the mother, which is the premise, into your room, the baby will come with it the mother and the heart. That's what I, I used to teach, uh, to teach modus ponens. Look at the orange and its seed. The seed, which is the conclusion, modus ponens, I'm revising that, I'll show you the contrast with this. The seed is inside the orange, round. If you take the orange home, which is the premise, the whole thing, the mother set, orange, home, you have taken the seed along. I've given you an envelope of money. The envelope contains $1,000. Somewhere is So you have it. If I give you the envelope, the envelope is the premise, the big set. Inside it is the conclusion. So if you it's take the envelope, if you what take you... the envelope, you have taken the money inside it. That's modus ponens. Now, as for tolens, it says if mango, then fruit. But the thing is not even a fruit, not fruit, negation of the consequence. Then it has to follow that it cannot be a mango because mangoes are already inside fruit. This thing is not even a fruit at all. Then it cannot be called a mango. That is the reasoning part, so it's valid. Why do we call it valid? If the two premises were accepted to be true, the conclusion will also be true with it, necessarily. Okay, quick type of validity is this. This is modus tollens. Remember the other name for it. Take your time, it's coming. Tollens, look at the name. Negating the consequent. So all mangoes are fruits. What did we do next? That's how you name the reasoning. What did we do next? All mangoes are fruits, we said, this thing is not a fruit, a negation of the consequence. Therefore, we concluded that it is not a mango, and that is valid. By which parting, modus tollens. If instead of negating the consequent first, not fruit, then you conclude therefore not mango. If you don't do it that way, and you go and say all mangoes are fruits, my pen is not a mango. See what you are doing? You are negating the antecedent. Therefore, we should say it is not a fruit. It's a joke. The fact that it is not a mango doesn't mean it cannot be a fruit. Look at the pattern here. Not what you know about mangoes and fruits in everyday life. No, we are looking at the form. Before long, we'll use variables, PQRS. Okay. But if you say all mangoes are fruits, it doesn't prevent all bananas also from being fruits and all tangerines from being fruit, and all purpose from, they can all be in that set. So the big set is the set of fruits. Inside it, you can have square, rectangle, uh, whatever, rhombus, 
the different, and they will all represent different uh, fruit inside the big set of fruit. So mango, set of mangoes, set of bananas, set of popo, set of arugutu, sweet apple. <laughs> all inside. The fact that your next premise wrongfully says something is not a mango, it will just mean it is not inside the subset of mangoes, but the thing can still be inside the fruit set, but inside another subset. That's the point. Okay, so if you don't want to know all the reasons, just know why the pattern is not valid. If you say all mangoes are fruits, X is not a mango. That is a negation of the antecedent. You don't negate the antecedent in the premises. You don't do that. If you do that, you create a fallacy. The conclusion rather than end that. Okay, so what is the correct modus tollens pattern? All mangoes are fruits. This thing is not fruit. Then we can conclude it is not mango. Valid modus tollens. Let's try our hands on that. Our first examples again. So you can say all women are cheats, and I need responses from you. Use uh, use uh, a joke. And let's develop a modus tollens valid argument. The main premise is all women are cheats. These examples are easy to remember. That's why I use them. Eh? I don't believe that at all. All women are cheats. Let's use a joke. We want to create a modus tollens valid argument. Let's go. Uh, where are the hands? What should be the next premise? All of you. Ajo is not a woman. Ajo is not a Very good. So we bring the second one first. When I say the second one, doesn't mean all the time. Ajo is a cheat. Ajo is not a cheat. Because we want to bring the consequent first, you negate it. So modus tollens deals with what? Negating. That's why it's called negating the consequence. You turn it upside down. Like saying he was first from the bottom. Then we all know that the person was last in class. So pattern, all A's are B's. Tollens, now you have been modus tollens. All A's are B's. This thing is not a B, therefore we can validly conclude it's not an A. That's tollens, correct. <laughs> One of the one I gave you. If you are my friend, then you will tell me the truth. Let's do toilets using attack. Please put up your hand. Don't call someone. If you are my friend, then you tell me the truth. Want to develop a modus tollens valid argument using attack. Whose hand is up? No, uh, Jonathan Abri. If you are my friend, then you tell me the truth. Attack. If you are my friend, you tell me that you Atta is not my friend. So Atta if you say Atta is not my friend, you have denied the antecedent. That's not valid. You see? So if you are my friend, then you tell me the truth. What should be the next one? You are not my friend. If you are my friend, then you tell me the truth. Atta, continue. Atta did not tell me the truth. Very good. Therefore, Atta is not, not my friend. Not my friend. You see that? That is the valid one. We are used to, all of us, we are used to the wrong way of speaking and thinking. Ah, that is what we are doing. Critical thinking it will wash your thinking like parazo. <laughs> and correct the way we have been thinking erroneously in the past. Okay. Like brother B socks. Brother B white socks. I hate you. That's what we are doing. Okay. So I'm saying that atta, if I say if you are my friend, then you tell me the truth to make it a valid argument. You have to say you will you will not tell me the truth. Therefore, you are not my friend. That's modus tollens. Because we want to bring the consequent first, it has to come negated. Okay, negated means you introduce not. If the original statement is not, its negation will be what? Positive. Nega, nega, po. Remember, if the original is positive, its negation will be negative. But if the original is negative, its negation will be positive. You should keep that also as some can we in your food. Put it somewhere. Remember it always. Two negations yeah. will become positive. Okay. Positive. So let's pr practice again, slowly but steadily. 
uh, if you study, then you will pass. Ladies will do modus ponens valid argument with that. Files guys will do modus tollens valid argument with that. If you study, then you will pass. Brothers, are you ready? Tell me your modus tollens valid argument. Use Kofi. Tollens. If you Kofi study, did not pass. Very good. Kofi Therefore, will not pass. Will not pass. Kofi did, did not pass. Study. Will not pass. Shall not pass. No problem. So far as is consequent coming first negated, we are good. Then conclusion will be there for. Kofi does not study. Kofi does not study. Kofi did not study. It's correct. So the pattern correct for modus tollens. Tollens. The second one is if you study, then you will pass. Kofi did not pass. We bring the passing matter first. Negated. Then we conclude. Therefore. He did not study. We introduced the not. Okay, so not not, but conceive first before anti. That is modus tollens. If we want to do modus ponens, po, po, ponens, with the same premise, universal statement. Uh, if, if you study, then you will pass. I'm a statement. Yes, I'm a yes. I'm a Let's chat for three seconds. What happened yesterday? The best up here, not just up. Three seconds. Hey, we need, we need three seconds. We didn't say one second. Hey, match yesterday. Hey. I'm about to move on. What is it? Madam, I don't like I don't like I don't like Nigeria. 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 People should express themselves. We can continue now. All right. So I was saying that All right, sorry. modus ponens, you know. Modus ponens, you know. See how you learn. You can even tell the wrong ones, the patterns that disobey the rule. So for which reason we call them uh, formal fallacies. You can even detect two of such formal fallacies. One is affirming the consent, the fallacy. Because if we want to affirm in the premises, we don't affirm the consequence. We affirm that. So you know that I can teach your friends. You I can teach your friends. Teach your friends. <laughs> Keep teaching them. And you see that the more you are helping your friends understand, the better you are getting at. I learned this over 20 something years ago in my level 100. But you see, I don't have to be advised before I come because you keep imparting it to others, helping others. Often at no fee, you don't ask the enemy to say, oh, what is this? It's just the antecedent person. You bring the anti first and you end with the consequence. For example, Madame Liza is a she say, all women are cheating. So if we say, Amma is a woman, they have to follow that she says, oh, mm. so it's deductive. Which one is that? Oh, this one is a ponent. Poor, poor, dear. Uh -huh. this one. That's how you do it. Not some designer thing. You go and sit at the library with your spectacles and things and doing you. It won't stick. Learn it by engaging others, two people, your roommates, your senior who has done it already. You know, that kind of thing. They check it against the textbook and your slides and the content you have. That's modus ponens. Then tollens will rather bring the consequent first. I don't like saying the first one and the second because we can trick you and put the antecedent rather as if I say you, you will pass provided you study. I'm just saying you will pass if you study. So the if has become now. What follows the if is now the antecedent. We'll go to that level of difficult, but let's know the main lines first. Identify your consequent in the conditional statement. Bring that one first. We are doing two lines now. Bring that one first, but turn it upside down. Negate it. Then you conclude by negating the antecedent, and you are good. That's modus two lines. You know syllogism. You know valid. You know uh, sound. Sound means valid plus true premises. You know what a syllogism is. You know the types of valid patterns. You can determine when an argument is deductive. You can distinguish that from inductive. And who say man would it? You do, Papa. You will pass this course hands down with a little bit more commitment and practice. Okay. 
Even when we're studying what we had on the screen, we learned antecedent and consequent. Okay. Sister, please read through this quickly for me. Unless you're tired, so you get someone else. No, please, I'm not tired. Go ahead, Sister Kala. <laughs> deductive and inductive argument. Deductive argument. It is an okay. An argument is deductive when the truth of the premises guarantees or proves the truth of the conclusion. That's the language you should look at. That's all. Proof is for deduction, a valid deduction. Confirmation is for induction. That's all. Please continue. Okay. In a good or valid deductive argument, if the premises are assumed to be true, then the conclusion must be necessarily true. In a, valid, in a valid deductive argument, it is impossible for the premises to be true and the conclusion to be false at the same time. If not, you create a contradiction. Excellent. We have said that all, we said it over and over and over again. It's just a read over for you to see what that means now. Now let's see deduction and induction again. Please read, sister. It is wrong to say deductive arguments move from general premises to particular conclusions, while inductive move from particular to general. That is ambiguous. Yes, so your textbook wants us to touch on that because some books try to do the distinction this way. They'll tell you that, oh, if an argument is deductive, then its premises will be general and it will lead to a particular uh, conclusion, like the ones we did. All women are cheats. Mansa is a woman. Therefore, Mansa is a cheat. That's true, but it is not always the case. If I say Kofi is taller than Kwame and Kwame is taller than Koju, it has to follow that Kofi is taller than Kuju. But none of the statements is what? General. I didn't say all this or that in, in any of them. Kofi is taller than Kwame. Kwame is taller than Kuju. It must necessarily mean that Kofi is taller than Kuju. If these premises were true, you see. But there isn't any generalization there. But it's a deduction. So if someone tells you that, oh, to distinguish deduction from induction, the, the, the deductive ones will have general premises leading to a particular conclusion. He didn't help you. It's like saying that to distinguish a man from a woman, look at their hair. Women have long hair and men have short hair. Oh, these are Jesus that we see in movies. With his hair, plenty like that. Is he a woman? So it is not a good way. It is not an unambiguous way. Now you know ambiguity. If you define a distinction that way, it is a false contrast. That is the point that we want you to have in mind. And your textbook touches on that. So I want to make sure that is covered. Note that deduction is topic neutral. We saw that also earlier. So the content doesn't matter when you're doing deduction. All chichis are churches. This thing is a chichi. It has to follow therefore that it is what? Chorus answer. <laughs> Muted now. Take note. You see, we don't know what Chichi and Chacha stands for, but we are able to tell that if it is true that all Chichis are churches, and it is also true that this thing is a Chichi, then it must be true that this thing is a Chacha. And we don't know whether chichi or chacha exists or doesn't exist, whether there is any such thing, but it will be valid. So validity is not something you should be, you know, all bossy about. He has made a valid idea. If it is valid, it just means granted that the premises were true. The conclusion is drawing will also be true. It doesn't necessarily mean it's even speaking to content. So it is topic neutral. We don't care what the topic is about. I can say all A's are B's. This thing is not a B, so I conclude that therefore it is not an A. That will be valid, modus tollens. We don't care what the content is. That's one. <laughs> okay. But when you do induction, the unit seven, whose video you already have in your dossier at resource two, go there. You will see that as for inductive argument, you have to look at the content. Most Ghanaians have done this. 
yeah, yeah, it says you have to see most and few are not the same. So if I said most, then there is a higher likelihood. So you have to interrogate the content proper. So induction is not topic neutral. Deduction is. Then there's a, the last point on the screen that you should take note of. Deduction is about the form, the pattern, the structure. I've said that already. Induction is about the content. There are several examples in your textbook for you to imbibe. Well done. On the current screen, you will see that I've already engaged you on two of the valid patterns. You see how you are mobbing. You people, you are the sharpest folks in this course this semester. Right now, you can do <laughs> you can do modus ponens like something. Is that true? I'm telling you, you can do tolens like something. So now we want to use universal negations, not universal affirmations. So far, all we're saying is all women are this, all men are this, all metals are this. So we're, we're talking universal affirmations, affirmation, statements that are universal in nature, if gen statement, but they are what? Positive, they are not negative. I want to show you that universal negations are also conditional. Then I work you through how to open them out, to see your antecedent and consequent, to do at least what? Modus ponens or modus tollens valid pattern. Okay, so think about it. When we said all cats are mammals, we explained that to mean if X is a cat, then X is a mammal. Okay, so all cats are mammal. If X is a cat, then X is a mammal. All women are cheats. If X is a woman, then X is a cheat. What's the other one? All politicians are corrupt. If X is a politician, then X is corrupt. These are all ways of restating the conditional statement, uh, the, the universal statement, so that you can identify your antecedent and distinguish it from the consequence. So you can use it to build your valid patterns, okay? What about if I said, no, no man is perfect. How do you open that out to find your antecedent? In your it's also a universal statement, but it's a universal neg neg negative. So no man is perfect. If I want to use if then to capture that statement, how will I say it? Let's use coffee. No man is perfect. If Kofi is a man, Kofi is not perfect. Very good. That is the correct one. Yes. Yes. So the not goes into what? The consequent. If Kofi is a man, then yes, Kofi is not perfect. Don't say if Kofi is not a man, then he's perfect. No, that will not be a correct uh, translation of the universal negation. Therefore, whenever you have a, a universal negation, no man is perfect. When you rewrite it as a wow. Yes, it will be if X is a man, then X is not perfect. If X is a man, then X is not perfect. No student will register unless he or she is forced. So no, regi uh, no student registers unless forced. That is, if X is a student, then X will not register unless he is forced. You force him. That's how you open out a universal negation. As soon as you open it out that way, you now know your antecedent clearly. You know your consequent. If you are doing modus ponens, you put the antecedent first, you conclude with the consequent, just as it was given to you. You don't change the truth statement because you are doing modus ponens. So for instance, if we said no man is perfect, and I said develop a modus ponens valid argument, let's do it together. No man is perfect. You are doing modus ponens, valid argument. Let's use uh, a tire. Modus ponens. Premise a tire is a man. A tire is a man. Therefore, a tire is not perfect. A tire is not a man. <laughs> We have two minutes to go. Let's finish. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Listen. So, no man is perfect. For those who are doing modus a tire is a man. Because you are doing modus ponens. So, we affirm the antecedent. 
then we say, therefore, he's not perfect because the no man is perfect. When you open it out, it will be if X is a man, then X is not perfect. So we take attire as a man, therefore, attire is not perfect. This is not, we didn't introduce it, it was given to us in the raw material. Okay, so it is still modus ponens. Antecedent first, <laughs> conclude with consequent valid modus ponens. Let's do tolens with the same thing. Let's use uh, otele. Otele. You are wrong. Listen, so let's go slowly. No, <laughs> no man is perfect. What is the antecedent? Otele is a man, isn't it? That will be the antecedent. Then the then the consequence will be hotel is not perfect. Remember what we said. We are finishing. So remember what we said. Hotel is not. Nobody should say anything. Hold on. I let's finish. Okay. We said no man is perfect. It's just another way of saying if X is a man, then X is not perfect. So antecedent is X is a man. The consequence is X is not perfect. Now we want to do tolens. So no man is perfect. The next premise should say consequentness, then we end with antecedent, but both negated. So if you bring the consequent, whatever was given to you, negate it, turn it upside down. That's what I'm saying. Then whatever was given to you as antecedent also negated because we are doing modus tolens. The only thing is make sure the consequent comes first before the antecedent. So no man is perfect, which when we open out, we read, if man, then not perfect. Originally, that's the meaning. The next premise must say, Otele is perfect. Therefore, Otele is not a man. Can you see why that is the case? Because the original consequences, not perfect. So if you negate not perfect, it will become not not perfect, which is really perfect. So if man, then not perfect. Tolens will say, Otele is perfect. I'm bringing the second one first, but negated. Therefore, I can conclude the, the first one, also negated. Remember the antecedents just said F is a, S is a man. So it's negation with what? X is not a man. Simply put, no man is perfect for modus tollens valid at least. It will say, Otele is perfect. Therefore, Otele is not a man. What have we done? Simple. We brought the consequent first, concluded with the antecedent. But in, in each case, we negated. So if you get your translation right for the inversal negation, all you need to do is pick whatever was given to you as consequent after you open it up. Pick that one, bring it in, but negate, then end with the antecedent also negated. And that is where we will continue okay. when next we meet. Let me tell you what we have covered, then I take your question. So others can be, they have to attend that. You, you guys have done well. We are close to 400. Hey, well done. I'm happy I read the number. Let me tell you quickly what we've done. Thank you, my two ladies who read. Let me tell you what we've done so far. Look on our screen. The particular okay. and general, we haven't worried ourselves over them so much. Why? Because we know universal statements already, our general statements. The reference class and attribute class, we haven't finished this unit yet. We haven't touched on it. You still need it in unit seven, where I've even stressed it the, the, uh, the more, okay? The types of generalization, statistical versus gen, uh, universal, you will see that they are the reason why some of our arguments are what inductive and some are deductive. It's implied, but I haven't touched on them. Strategic learning. Then we see the last point, the universal generalizations as disguised conditional. That one, you know, I'm well, well, well. So if I say all men are mortal, you know, I'm saying if X is a man, then X is mortal. And now, X is mortal. The, yes, please. The distinction between deduction and induction. I think you are spot on on that one also. The little reading of that, you should do fine. 
One says, if my premises are true, you must accept my conclusion also. Otherwise, you create a contradiction. That is deductive. Whereas the induction says, well, I can have true premises that may not necessarily lead to that conclusion. You have true. We have done that. Then here, you know the valid patterns by name, all four of them. You even know the fallacies. But the content proper of those patterns, you know for the first two, Fudus Podens and Tolens. Okay, we haven't done this junkies notes. Take your time. Grah. On your own, you can read, but take your time. Let me point them out to you. Otherwise, you learn wrong things and then it will settle. Then when the correct one is coming, your system will be resisting it with all your energy. We don't want that. Then valid argument and sound argument. We know validity to be what? A good deduction. When you deduce correctly, it will be valid. And it can be any of the four. Then even after your arguments are valid, if the premises are true, then we'll say it's even what sound. That's that one too, you know, done that. The main dis distinction between deduction and induction are on your screen. I've said that already. Then we revised, we recalled argument, lecture three. We brought it back to help our members. Reasons leading to what? A single conclusion. Every argument will ultimately have only one conclusion. Even if there is a sub premise, sub, 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 look at their name, they are sub, Ishishim. ultimately it's one thing the person is saying. The rest are reasons he or she is using to support him that. Then you saw the indicator of to guide you. Okay. Now we saw this also. These are examples to show why, for the first instance, we say it is a deduction and a valid one, modus ponens. Then the second one, we say it is an induction, meaning that we are forcing a conclusion out of the premises. The premises are not able to support that conclusion. On your screen, this one. Uh, further examples. Meanwhile, the second example gives you another deductive argument, which is no longer ponens, but tolens, yet also valid. We saw the way to go about it. Then we revised our deduction and induction again. Look at this one too. Uh, what we shouldn't see. We said so deduction doesn't look at the contents, where we saw the chichi thing, you know. <laughs> and then we said, I don't say that one moves from general to particular, as the other most of particular to general. It doesn't make a good contrast between deduction and induction. And then we go to this slide. And you will see if we went through the whole slides, by the time we, we about seven or eight slides ahead of us are all covered. We'll just go through them for you to see that you have covered it. I want to pause here till next week. Some pedagogical issues for you from the coordinator. Now, not your lecturer, but the one coordinating the course. Listen, your continuous assessment will be on units one, two, three, five, six, and seven. The substantive content will be on six and seven for your interim assessment, i.e. the 30%. The unit one, two, three, five will give you a friend say, background. You know, you should know declarative value judgment, what have you, open texture, uh, ambiguity. So you can understand when we say, uh, a certain reasoning is deductive or, or inductive. It's, someone is using a normative law or an empirical law. So the first three units and the unit five will give you some multiple choice kind of questions and short, short answer. A substantive one where the reasoning, your reasoning will be checked, will be in the unit six and seven. That's why those contents we have done uninterrupted recorded lecture that will, for you. It is right now in your resource to I uploaded it the other day. Just copy the link paste into a browser and engage it in its six and seven for your interim assessment. That will come on, on the in the eighth week. The specific days we'll get from academic affairs, okay? Then the final exam, you top up with units nine and 10. So, so final exam will be on six, seven, nine, and 10 units. That content is also there. The preliminary content, you should be able to get slides on it all over your course after the textbook, reading, asking questions, this interactive session for all the groups, if you like, and you are good to go. I've finished. Any questions? <laughs> My brood, let me end it with you. Then I, I can take it. Yes. Uh, we are done. So those who have to go into yeah, another question. question. Yes, let me let me question, end it. Okay. Let me end it there. Oh, I should have a question. Yeah, question. Yes, go ahead. So let's take the yeah. questions one after yeah. the other.